Softmax is one of the most important functions in deep learning as for today. What it does is it takes in a vector of real numbers and returns a probability distribution that we can reason about. The usual way of calculating it is by replacing each element with an exponent raised to the power of said element divided by the sum of exponents of all elements in our vector. Although there is one caveat. Since it uses an exponential function that grows, well, exponentially, if our input vector will contain multiple positive values, it can overflow, as we will add a lot of big numbers together in our divisor. And the way to mitigate this is by subtracting the maximum of our vector from the exponent. That way, the powers will always be negative, and our values will remain in the range of 0 to 1. To have an estimate for how fast our kernel can theoretically be, we need to calculate how much floating point operations are we doing and how much memory are we accessing. For bytes loaded, it's quite simple. We load the whole vector once and save it once. So we get two times our vector size memory accesses of floating point values that are four bytes each. For the flops, we have to split our function into sub-operations. First, we calculate the maximum, giving us n operations, where n is the size of our vector. We then subtract the maximum from our vector, giving us another n operations. This is followed by an exponent for the next n operations. The next operation is sum across all elements. So again, n operations. And for the final output, each element needs to be divided by the sum, giving us the next n operations. This leaves us with 5 flops per 8 bytes loaded. With this info, we can calculate a theoretical maximum of a performance that we can get out of this kernel. With 5 floating point operations per 8 bytes loaded, we are bottlenecked by memory bandwidth, which is 1 terabyte per second on my GPU. And that gives us a theoretical maximum of 625 gigaflops. We can now compare the speed of different implementations for different widths of the input. The height or bar size in case of neural networks will be fixed at 128. As two reference points, I took the PyTorch kernel as well as the Triton kernel that was available in their documentation as an example. You are probably screaming right now looking at the result. And I pulled my hair on it for quite a while until I took out the profiler and did some research on how are CUDA stores done. And Nvidia GPUs use something called write back cache. This essentially means that we are writing to L2 cache only during kernel execution and the global memory receives the data later when we discard the cache block. And since our L2 write speed is much higher than our global memory read speed, the only bottleneck is reads from global memory. So our theoretical maximum increases by 2x. Note that the increase is only valid for those kernels that actually fit in the L2 entirely. For those that don't, we still pay the cost of going into main memory, hence the slowdown on bigger input sizes. Keep the theoretical max performance in mind. I'm gonna remove it from the graph right now for better readability. If you watch the episode on neural networks, we wrote a very simple softmax kernel there. In it, each thread calculates one output element of a softmax and we create as many threads as there are elements in our input matrix. There is one major bottleneck in this kernel. Each thread in the row recalculates the maxval and the divisor. While this wasn't really a big problem in our MNIST solver, where the height of the input was much bigger than the width, but in recent trends, the amount of classes that we are predicting is much bigger than the batch size that we are feeding the model. I'm not patient enough to run it for all of the shapes, but for just 10,024 elements, it achieves a magnificent 8.9 gigaflops. 
the key to making a fast softmax algorithm is understanding how to perform a fast reduction algorithm. A reduction algorithm is a type of algorithm where we need to perform an operation on every input element where the input to the operation is a result of the previous operation. In order for this to parallelize nicely, the operator needs to be associative. That means that no matter the order of the operations, the result will be the same. This also gives us a wonderful property, where we don't need to calculate sequentially, but we can do it in a tree-like manner. In the case of our softmax, we perform two associative reductions. One is finding a maximum, and the second one is summing all elements to calculate our divisor. Now, with this prerequisite taken care of, we need to look at speeding up our algorithm. And to do that, we need to think more deeply about how do we behave on a thread and block level. In our naive kernel, each thread operates on the entirety of the data and independently performs a reduction. It doesn't take much effort to notice that this is a lot of repeated work. We're going to need to be able to distribute the work between our threads. The first thing is to split our input vector so that each thread operates on a different part of it. Then we can perform the reduction on those inputs like we did before. Afterwards, we transmit the data between the threads and finalize the reduction. And in the case of softmax, we need to finalize by transmitting the data to all other threads. This is how the code for this reduction looks like. For the first step, we perform the reduction on a thread level. We then exchange the data between the threads in shared memory and perform the reduction on a block level. And finally, we broadcast the data to all other threads. And in the same way that we did for our maximum, we can speed up calculating the divisor. We can now check the speed of our new kernel. And even though we are much better than the initial 8 gigaflops, we are still off compared to real world implementations. Another thing that we can do to improve the speed of our kernel is to investigate our memory access pattern. And we can see that we are accessing our data with a stride of block size. If you watch the video on DRAM and memory coalescing, you know that this is a very bad access pattern. Essentially, we need to change our access pattern so that each warp accesses values that are adjacent in memory. And the code change is actually very simple. We just need to change our for loop when reading the values from a stride of 1 to a stride equal of our block dimension. By adding coalescing, we've taken a big step into getting a similar performance to Torch and Triton kernels. The next area of improvement is in the way that we handle our reduction in memory. So far, most of our reduction was happening in shared memory which is fast, but not quite as fast as our registers. If you watched our episode on GPU architecture, you know that threads in a processing block have a shared register file. So there's nothing stopping us from using this fact to share data between the threads faster. The way that we can share values between threads is by using this operation. And this is the pseudocode for what it does. We pass in a mask depicting which threads should participate in the exchange, what variable we want to get from the other thread, an offset that will be used to calculate the lane index of a thread we want to get the value from, and the warp size that we are using. In our imaginary scenario, a warp will consist of two threads, but remember that in reality it's 32 threads. What we want is instead of doing the second step in shared memory, we perform a partial reduction on a register level 
and then move all of the reduced values to one warp in shared memory and we perform another reduction in registers to get our final value. To achieve this, we have to rewrite our reduction code in this way. In the first part, we use our shuffle instruction to perform a reduction on a warp level. We then do the synchronization in shared memory. The first if statement checks if we are in the first thread in a warp that holds our final reduction value. And in the end, we finish our reduction using registers of the first warp. With this, we take another step closer to the performance of Torch and Triton. Our next step is to utilize loading in Float4. This gives us multiple low-level benefits. First of all, we issue one instruction for four memory loads, reducing the amount of instructions issued. And it also reduces the amount of index calculations that we are doing for memory access. With float4 utilization, we are finally getting a kernel that is on par with Torch and Triton kernels. The next step is to unroll our loops. The compiler usually does that for you, but you can control this behavior by using a pragma directive that takes in the amount of unrolls that we want the compiler to do. And by running a search over all of the reasonable combinations of unrolling and block dimensions, we get a kernel that has a better performance to Torch and Triton. This is the best that I have been able to achieve in terms of this softmax kernel style. But there is a possibility to change the format of our kernel. And for this, I am going to return to our simpler kernel and remove some parts, just so it fits on screen and we can highlight the issue. And the issue is that we are loading our input twice once when we are fighting the max value, and the other time when we are calculating the divisor. It would be really great if we could do it in one loop, so that we don't have to waste our precious memory bandwidth. The problem is that the calculations of the second loop depend on the result of the first one. But there is a solution proposed by the brilliant guys from NVIDIA in a paper called Online Normalizer Calculation for Softmax. Let's see how it works and how we could come up with the idea. If we would be calculating the divisor in the first loop, the initial value that we got would be this. But in another iteration, we find a new maximum, leaving us with a new value for the contribution of x1 to the divisor. The question that we need to ask is how did the value change after finding the new maximum? We could write it in this form, where our new contribution is equal to the previous contribution fixed by some amount. If we write out the equation and simplify it, we get to a result that is independent of the value in our vector and only depends on the old maximum value and the new maximum value and the incorporation into our code requires us to change two parts. The first part, where we do the initial reduction in one thread, and the only difference is that if we find a new maximum, we perform a fix of our initial divisor estimate. Theoretically, we don't need to do the if statement, but exponents are expensive, so it's best to avoid doing them if we don't need to. The second part that we need to change is how we do the reduction across a warp. And the important change here is that we need to determine which value to fix. If the incoming maximum is bigger than our maximum, we need to fix our divisor. And else, we need to fix the incoming divisor. With this kernel, we can see that we are getting a much better performance for the bigger input sizes. We are a bit slower for the smaller input sizes, and the reason is that they fully fit in our cache, so the cost of doing extra calculations outweighs the benefits of reduced memory accesses. This was the last kernel that I've been able to come up with. But hey, maybe you can make one that goes even faster. The code for all of the benchmarks is available on my GitHub, 
and I highly encourage you to play around with it. I'm hosting a buy me a coffee for those that want to support this channel. A shout out to Alex, Udi Transaria, Stuart McVicker, Ilgun Ha, and free anonymous donors that supported so far. But you can always support me for free by subscribing, leaving a like, commenting, and sharing this video with your friends. And I will see you in the next episode. Bye.